Hello and welcome to a review for the Biology 1 final exam, lecture final. Now, my first comment is this. Uh, this is a relatively long test and it will take you a relatively short period of time to do it. Okay, uh, It's longer than a regular test. I think it's got 75 questions and the way this works is about 50 of the questions are like every other test we've done. So every other test we've done has been 50 questions and this one is going to be the same 50 question test and then there's an additional 20 to 25 questions that make this exam comprehensive. Okay, As I said at the beginning of the semester, the final exam is comprehensive. This is nothing for you to stress about. Uh, the comprehensive questions are those uh, which are basically the main concepts of the class. Okay, If you kind of understand what, for instance, chloroplast and mitochondria do, then you're going to be just fine on the comprehensive questions on this test. I would not try to go back and study for comprehensive stuff. Uh, there's zero chance of it helping you. Again, these are like big overarching questions uh, that you should know if you've been paying any form of attention in this class. Okay, so it's all there. Now, uh, on the test, on the test. So again, 75-ish questions, 70, 75, and the way that Canvas sets this thing up is I can either scramble the uh, multiple choice answers on the test or I can not scramble them. And that works out well sometimes and other times it becomes a huge pain in the neck. So what I have to tell you is this. Read all the answer choices. The first answer choice might be that none of the answer options are right. Uh, normally you'd see that, like for instance, as a last option. Uh, sometimes when I scramble these, it just really screws this stuff up. So read every answer choice uh, before you select the answer you, you have picked. Uh, on this test, there are several large, what I would call matching blocks in the grand scheme, uh, or in essence where you'd have like a paragraph, you read that paragraph, and in that paragraph are a few blanks, and you have to go through and tell me what words go in those blanks. I tend to find that students do extraordinarily well in this, and it goes by quite quickly. Okay, lots of those. Uh, one actual matching block of about eight or ten questions, and we'll talk about that as we get into it uh, for the actual review. Let me think if there's anything else. Uh, let's see. Oh, the numbering on the test. The, just the way that the Canvas interaction is, the numbers on the test are going to be really jumbled. It's going to be very strange in some cases. So just start at the top and work your way down, all right? If, the, if like you're looking at it, it's like, wow, these the numbers, like one, two, three, four, this doesn't make as much sense as I would like. I'm sorry. It's just Canvas. Okay? It's just Canvas and the way it's done on this final exam, okay? So just ignore that. Start at the top. Work your way down. You're going to be in good shape. Okay. <clears throat> now, what I have to talk about in terms of the test itself is pretty limited. There's just not much to say. All right, there really isn't much to say. There's a lot of material, but not a whole lot that needs talking about. So let me give you an example of how I'll get this organized. So I've got uh, four blocks on a little sheet of paper here in front of me that basically represents the majority of the test. Now, if I were you, I would go and do the study guide, make sure you've done the study guide. I would look over my quizzes, make sure you've done your quizzes. I would look at the two Punnett square sheets. I think the second Punnett square sheet I made that specifically with this test in mind, so reading through and being able to answer those questions is really going to help. Those sheets and the answers provided on those sheets probably represent uh, 20 or 25 percent of the test, Okay, a, a significant portion. So a lot of the test uh, can be answered with the knowledge you would gain from the Punnett square sheets. Now don't expect to have a bunch of Punnett squares on this test. Uh, you may be able to work through one or two uh, if needed, but I can I guarantee you that if I was taking this test, I would not do any Punnett squares. I wouldn't need it, okay? Because it's all uh, done verbally, and I've got sort of stuff written out in a way that'll make it pretty easy to understand. Okay, let me just get into this, and I'll comment more as I go. Uh, and one last comment, I guess, before we proceed, and that is gonna be to read the instructions for the test prior to starting, 
okay? Read the instructions for the test before you get started. Uh, you'll understand later. All right, here we go. Uh, so I have four blocks on the sheet of paper here in front of me. Those blocks are for mitosis and meiosis, uh, which has a decent amount of material for it. A block for protein synthesis, which literally only has about three lines of text on my sheet of paper here. A block for genetics, and literally has three blocks of text. And then a block for viruses and bacteria, and I literally have one line of text uh, to talk about viruses and bacteria. Okay, uh, so let's get rolling. Mitosis and meiosis. If I were you, I would know about DNA. You need to know that you have 23 chromosomal pairs, 23 pairs of chromosomes. That would be 23 from mom, 23 from dad, 23 pair of chromosomes uh, in your initial uh, zygote, if you will, okay, when you were formed. So all of your cells today have 23 pairs of chromosomes, except your gametes, that would be egg and sperm, gametes have 23 total chromosomes. So an egg has 23 chromosomes, a sperm cell has 23 chromosomes, those come together, form a zygote, and out comes a, a human with uh, 23 pair of chromosomes. So you need to know the difference between a chromosome and chromatin. Okay, what is chromatin versus chromosome? Uh, tell me about two N cells versus one N cells. That would be diploid cells versus haploid cells. Uh, let's see. Be able to kind of walk me through what is mitosis. Walk me through what is meiosis. I'm not going to go into any form of detail on the stages of this. I have no interest in that. I want you to understand the concept of what we're dealing with here. All right. What's the process of making gametes? What is oogenesis? What is spermatogenesis? How many sperm do you get functionally after meiosis? How many eggs do you get functionally after meiosis? All right. These are the concepts I want from you. Again, <laughs> define a zygote. What does heterozygous mean? What does homozygous mean in terms of a zygote? In terms of genes? In terms of alleles? Okay. Give me the main overarching concepts. Uh, tell me why mitosis? Why do we reproduce sexually? What is meiosis? What's the goal of this? Hint, hint. Genetic diversity is important. Yeah, man. That's how this works. See, oh, uh, in, in the realm of mitosis, walk me through the cell cycle. You know, tell me about interphase. Tell me about the G1, S, and G2 phases and what happens in each one of those. Tell me about how interphase is the long period and mitosis, the division, is relatively short by comparison. Tell me about cell plates versus, uh, what do you call them? Um, cleavage furrows. Yeah, man. All right. Number two, protein synthesis. Uh, okay, so proteins are strings of amino acids which are peptide bonded together. Now, that is a protein. A protein is a string of amino acids peptide bonded together in the grand scheme. That is what this is. The code for making proteins comes from your DNA. The intermediate between DNA and protein is RNA. On this test, I expect you to be able to walk me through and tell me about transcription versus translation. All right, we're going from DNA to protein. Tell me all about transcription versus translation. Tell me about the enzymes involved in transcription and translation. Tell me about the enzymes involved in DNA synthesis. Tell me about the enzymes involved in making messenger RNA. For that matter, tell me about the three types of RNA. The enzymes involved in the manufacturing process. What do the three types of RNA do? How do they look? How can you tell the difference? Like, I want to know about these. What are exons? What are introns? What's an anticodon site? You know, where would the amino acid come to play on this? What's the role of the ribosome? Yeah, man. you got to be able to explain this to me. This is important. Major concepts. Not tiny little itty-bitty details. Major concepts. Right, number three, genetics. Uh, and again, like, man, like, these terms, these terms are so important. Dominance versus recessive traits, okay? That plays right into genes and alleles that I talked about in the first section here. Right, dominant traits versus recessive traits. What do I mean when I say homozygous and heterozygous? 
I'm struggling to read my own handwriting. Hang tight, folks. Oh, do a Punnett square star. <laughs> so the idea is that you need to be able to work through those Punnett square worksheets that I put up. Uh, those will, those are going to help you out. You won't necessarily be doing a Punnett square per se. Uh, you won't like I'm I'm not going to make you you know fill in necessarily, but understanding how you would do that Punnett square and then understanding a person's genotype versus their phenotype. All right, if I tell you that somebody's got a recessive trait and they are uh, breeding with someone whom is homozygous dominant, what are their offspring going to look like? These are the types of questions I'm going to ask you. Okay, if I've got two people that are heterozygous, how many of their offspring are going to res yeah, heterozygous? How many of their offspring are going to display a recessive trait? I'm going to give you like more detail than that, but at the end of the day, that's the question I'm asking. Okay, so I'm going to dress it up a little bit. But the reality is I'm asking very simple questions. Somebody's homozygous. They are having children with somebody's heterozygous. How many of their kids are going to have whatever phenotype? How many of their kids are going to have whatever genotype? All right. This is important. Uh, understand the concept of a carrier for a gene. The uh, famous example here is sickle cell. Uh, so a person that gets a sickle cell trait from their mom and their dad will have a variety of physical problems. A person that is a carrier for a trait, so a person that only has a, one trait from mom and then dad gives normal genetics, uh, that person is going to be carrying a trait. It's not going to be expressed. They're going to be carrying a trait. Understand the concept of the carrier. Uh, understand the concept of uh, sex-linked or X-linked traits versus autosomal traits. So there, are, I went through some very famous examples of sex-linked traits in uh, inheritance that we did during the genetics chapter. This is important. So sex-linked versus, or X-linked, sex-linked, X-linked, same thing, uh, versus autosomal traits. Okay, they are uh, interesting. And the diseases that are linked to those are also quite fascinating. All right, um, and then on to viruses and bacteria. I'm not gonna play any games with you. Uh, I said that I had one line of text, and I will read that to you straight off here. It says, bacteria versus viruses versus eukaryotic cells. You need to be able to tell me the difference. Uh, the main traits of a bacterium versus a virus. You should really understand the main traits of bacterium at this stage. Like, you, you should know about peptidic lichen, you know? Like, you should know about its nucleoid region, that it doesn't have true organ uh, or membrane-bound organelles, okay? This is important. Okay, tell me about viruses versus bacteria. Viruses are very simple. They're considered non-living. Why? What's a capsid? You know, what's inside of that capsid? Tell me about viruses. What are they? Tell me about eukaryotic cells by comparison. You need to know the differences between eukaryotic cells, bacteria, and viruses. This is a key concept, key concept of biology one. Like I might throw some examples at you that you'll need to be able to identify as a bacterium versus a virus. That would be like the main overarching ones that we discussed in that lecture, okay? The big ones, the main ones, the important ones that you probably have come into contact with in your life at this stage. Common cold, okay? Uh, staph infection, right? What's a bacteria? What's a virus? These are the things I need you to know. And really, folks, that's about the extent of it. Again, a lot of this test is going to be major overarching concepts that we've covered throughout the entire class. Uh, and the questions that are off of the lectures you've done recently, they are, are pretty straightforward. So if you look back through your quizzes, if you look at the study guide, if you look at the Punnett square sheet, you're literally going to lay your eyes on 80% of the questions that I want you to know for this test. Okay? Like verbatim, pretty much. So use this time effectively. Study. You know what you need to do well in this class. Do it. Get the work done. Be prepared. And I think that's about that. So um, if you need me, I'm going to try to be on Thursday. And thank you so much.